Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Welcome, every, everyone. Today we'll, uh, we'll hear from, from uh, Professor Stanislas Griegel, the second lecture of this series of three lectures, um, Discovering the Human Person with Blessed John Paul II. On Monday, he uh, spoke to us about the origins of an adequate anthropology, according to John Paul II. And uh, today's lecture would be on the theme the new evangelization via pulcritudinis, via crucis. I, um, before I introduce him, I would like also to, to greet Professor Marcello Pera, president, former president of the Italian Senate, who is kindly here with, with us today, and also Mr. Joel Wood, our personal friends of uh, Professor Griegel. Please welcome, welcome uh, with me Professor Griegel. Thank you very much. Once more again, I ask you to forgive me my voice. And uh, I enter immediately in medias res. John Paul II surprised not only theologians and clerics, but even lay people when he began his pontifical teaching with meditation on the beauty of the human body. The heirs of the 16th sexual revolution expected a radical change in the church and the vision of man. A change clearly took place, but that revolution came out of this, uh, from it, all weaker. John Paul II spoke of the beauty that appears in this world and in us, but that comes from beyond the world and us, revealing our symbolical nature. This beauty appears in our passing world and makes the world a path on which we must go set out, if we wish, so that our life can have meaning and words that transcend the possibilities of our industrious making. To live and to think symbolically means to live and to think with so great a desire to encounter another person that when we do encounter him, we think and live still more from yet another encounter, the encounter with God. To those who think and who live in the desire of this encounter, every being reveals itself as truth and goodness. It is as if they sense and see in every being that bonum verum et pulchrum convertuntur, the good, the true, and the beautiful are convertible. The truth and the goodness of every being reveals themselves in the form of the beautiful. The beautiful makes us eager to work. We have said it yesterday. That is, it makes us eager to know every being as truth and to love it as good. The beautiful does not compel man. It begs him to draw near, advancing in the direction it shows, it shows to him. I say, Vitiwa, beauty is a key to the mystery and the call to transcendence. It is an invitation to save life and to dream of the future. End of citation. The torrent of beauty flowing through man and the world transfigures them as it reveals love. The human person transfigured by the torrent of beauty does not feel alone and abandoned in the world. Someone has visited him and invited him to himself. Beauty is the form of love. The person is love. The call with which the beautiful speaks to man helps him to pass from solitude to a marvelous dwelling in beauty's house, in which everyone feels himself at ease. Beauty has a pascal and therefore a priestly power. It binds together both the riverbanks, human and divine, between which it flows. 
It calls the human person to life in dialogue, human divine dialogue. We have to know how to wait for it. We have to mature toward it. It is a gift, a grace. The gift comes from beyond the conceptual operations of reason. Only prophets and mystics live from the beauty of the true and the good, that is to say, of the gift. And poets, who tremble because they do not know what they say with their lips, speak of it most adequately. Once I had the courage to tell John Paul II that most of the people who listened to him did not understand his catechesis and homilies. They are physically near you, Holy Father, I said. But they are uh, far away from what you are, you are saying. He answered me briefly. It does not matter. Some things have to be said. Man first hears the word. Only afterward does he understand. Slowly, we understand the beautiful truths of the destiny God gives us. Because we fulfill it in communion with others, and it is a difficult challenge to live and to cooperate with, the, uh, with other people. We are born in the beautiful, and we are reborn thanks to the beautiful. The beautiful teaches us to live pascali. That is, it teaches us to die for values that are greater than our life. It teaches us to live in hope, for it promises that we will be reborn in God's grace, which is worth more than life. The beautiful has only one meaning, the rebirth of the human person, not his reform, but his rebirth, that is to say, conversion to the truth. I said with you all. And so gradually, I learned to value beauty accessible to the mind, that is to say, truth. Man, man cannot be reformed, I repeat it. He can only be reborn. That is what Nicodemus could not understand. The learned Nicodemus could not understand in the dialogue with Jesus. Carl Vitua was aware of the sterility that threatens any philosophical thought that distances itself from the beautiful and therefore also from the experience of love. He did not hesitate to immerse his thought in beautiful love. He was not an erudite man, it is true, but in recompense he was a friend of the wisdom that cannot be obtained by erudition, but by love and by its beauty. In the erudite man, the transcendentals, the true, the good, and the beautiful, are not are not <coughs> events in the learned man, in the erudite philosophers. <coughs> Excuse me. They are not events. It is very important. In them, they are objects constructed by their reason, usually borrowed from other erudite people and registered in, in their memory. It is significant that the erudite do not speak of the beautiful. The object of beauty cannot be, cannot be constructed. Beauty's substitute is not beautiful. The beautiful, the true and the good happen in man, but they cannot be explained by, by his action. They come to him as a gift. The metaphysics of the events of the beautiful truths and the beautiful good liberate man from himself and cure him upwards. Addition, on the other hand, only serves him to a certain point. The person in whom the beautiful truths and the beautiful good come to pass burns with the God's love. The anthropology of the burning bush on Mount Horeb, or if you prefer, the adequate, adequate anthropology of John Paul II transcends the science of man reduced to predicates. Carol Vitua writes in person and act, uh, acting person 
that transcendence in integrates the person who moves toward it and the way it, which is body and spirit. Transcendence integrates those who burn with and for it. This is how I understand Vaitova's philosophical work. His philosophy is burning philosophy. John Paul II spoke of man's transcendence, speaking of man's prehistory and post-history, when in his first Wednesday catechesis, he read with us the biblical story of the origin and end in the light of human person's experience. He could speak only in a poetical way, co-creating his language with the father of great poetry, God is. In this way, Boitua name names God, father of great poetry. God does not reveal the meaning and value of human life with concepts, but with his word, which is his poetry. In this poetry is found our past origin and future end. In the, pers in the perspective of the poetry, that is the father's word, I see Karl Wojtyla's adequate anthropology as built on the basis of moral experience, which in its essence, essence is poetic experience. An adequate anthropology comes to pass in the human person when his earthly here joins with the heavenly there. Moral experience would not occur if heaven were not united to earth in him. The morality of the act, act reveals that the act is related to something that is not this act. The morality interprets the act accomplished here in the light of what is there. John Paul II saw the limit of man's self-understanding in the greatness of the human heart that desires truths. And he saw the limits of his disgreatness of the human heart in the immensity of the word of the living God. This is the reason why the Pope's teaching cannot be completely identified with his writings. The most important text in his teaching was his person, proclaiming the word of the living God. His person was an adequate anthropology. This is why people adhere more to his person than to his texts. People do not live from abstractions. The most beautiful poem on earth is the exhausted humanity of Christ. In the play Our God's Brother, written by the young Karl Wojtyla, Adam, later brother Albert Knielowski, addresses these words to Christ, whom he contemplates in, in a painting Adam himself painted, Exechon. I sighed, they have exhausted you, but with all this you have remained beautiful, the most beautiful of the sons of men. Such beauty was never repeated again. Oh, what a difficult beauty, how hard. Such beauty is called mercy. The scientists do not know mercy because they do not know what beauty is. When they speak of it, they refer to something else. They do not unite their work to love. So you should not be surprised if John Paul II's poetry, more than all his philosophical texts, introduces us to the vision of man who desires to become God and of God who also has desired to be man. Only poetry can unveil the mystery of the love or mercy that unites man to God. I said Vaitua, art is the language of the human being. It is the language of that being who, before losing himself in the multiplicity of things or allowing himself to be absorbed by countless activities that give us the illusion of living intensely, has the capacity for wonder. Wonder and the poetry that arises from it, prepare us for that which does not pass away. Norvit, already cited yesterday by me, says, of the things of this world, 
only two remain. Two alone, poetry and goodness and nothing else. Societies would be different if they listened with greater attention to the voice of the beauty that burst in their poets. Perhaps they would live in greater material poverty, but they would surely not live in so great an interior poverty. It means in misery. What we have, what we see now, in at least in Europe. That I cite what more again in orbit. That which is beautiful is not what pleases today or has pleased, but what should please. Just as that which is good is not what gives the most pleasure, but what makes us better. Beauty gives itself to everyone's contemplation, calling everyone to identify with it. It knows neither master nor slave. It abolishes the master-slave dialectic by uniting everyone in itself with some regard to prov prov provenance, 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 race, religion, or rank. The beauty that is the form of love does not differentiate between person, persons. On the path towards beauty, we can call it the via pulchritudinis. The truth happens in beauty's every fragment. The maturation toward beauty takes place when we entrust ourselves to its fragments and place our hope in the consequences of this entrustment. I would define this maturation as adequatio fide spei ed amoris cum pulchritudine, the adequation of faith, hope, and love in beauty. For me, it is the definition of truth. Modify it. This way of knowing the truth is difficult. On the one hand, every created fragment of beauty on the way proclaims the beauty God promises. On the other hand, we are tempted to rest in this fragment. The logic of rationalism does not reach as far as the logic of love for the beautiful body, beautiful thoughts, and beautiful actions. In the tragic age of contempt for the beauty of the person, in the years of the Nazi occupation and Soviet domination, but also in his years of study in Western Europe after the war, it became clear to Vaitiu, Karol Vaitiwa that man's surrender to a nearsighted reason that calculates based on life's circumstances leads nowhere, nowhere. Or rather, it leads to so profound a profanation of the beauty of the body, thoughts, and actions that they cease to be epiphanies of the true and the good. He who refuses the gift also refuses the giver. The negation of the gift of God is the negation of God and of man. Man is the first and most beautiful gift that God makes to man. The sacred char character of the human person's beauty was revealed to Vaitua in the friendships he formed during his university years. It was revealed to him in the words of the great Polish poets, whose words he recited in the clandestine Rhapsodic Theater, at a time when his compatriots paid for the beauty of the love revealed in their body, thoughts, and actions with life in a concentration camps. To Plato's, to Plato's saying, beauty is difficult, we can add, it is also dangerous for all those in whom it is revealed. The sacred character of the beauty of the human person was revealed to Karol Vaitua, first of all, by the love that united man, man and woman. Vaitua expressed this in two works, which, which form a, a single whole. The first is a series of spiritual exercises he pre uh, preached to artists in Krakow in April 1962, only recently only recently published in Polish with the title Evangelization and Art. The second is a series of catechises on the beauty of the human body given by Pope John Paul II. The latter evolved into a description of man's moral maturation on the paths that leads him from his origin to his end. I add immediately 
that the crowning of these words is the Roman triptych, in which John Paul II asked the fundamental question of the source, the origin, and judgment, the end. I say it, wait you are. To the extent that we think of the gospel as a living totality, the bonds uniting the gospel and art appear even more clearly. These bonds are formed, above all, because the God of whom the gospel speaks is beauty. He called artists' attention uh, during these exercises, preached in Krakow in 62. He called uh, the artist's uh, attention to the fact that we discover beauty in the totality of creation as well as in the words of man. He based his reflection of the words of Zygmunt Kaczynski, Polish poet of uh, between uh, 1820 and 1860. Uh, these words, the torrent of beauty flows through you, but you are not beauty. Artist. Beauty, Bishop Vaitiwa adds, in these words we find a profound self-awareness. Every human being can say this of himself. Every human being is an artist through whom flows the beauty. We must accept, I said Vaitiwa, from this exercise, and acknowledge, we must accept and acknowledge that of all the talents we possess, the greatest is that of humanity. If God asks us to give an account of how we have used our various talents, talents, he will ask us from this point of view, how have we used that fundamental talent, the talent of humanity? This is the greatest talent. Why? Because God himself paid for our humanity. End of station. This price that was paid reveals the meaning of humanity, the value of the work of art that is man. To accept the ugliness of the lie and of evil means to devastate poetry God and man are. That is the essence of secularization. The body, thoughts, and actions that are bent over the earth do not receive the beauty of the divinity which reveals itself like a lightning flash at an unforeseeable moment, we have to wait for it. So we must not be surprised if the enemies of divine and human transcendence bend poetry and philosophy toward the earth, because human beings cannot follow the light that the sudden illumination leaves in them. Their hostility toward God of these enemies and men explode in persecution. They kill poets and priests above all, so that the torrent of beauty does not course through the world and revive us. Look what has happened after the, during the very uh, solid revolution. The poets and the priests was the, were the first to be killed. Until the last moment of his life, blessed John Paul II spoke with the voice of the priest and the poet, which prophetically listened to the voice of the moral conscience. This was his contemplation of God's beauty reflected in the human person. I will never forget the conversation with Cardinal Vaitiva in the garden of the Cistercian Abbey at the Angeov, where we have stopped, where we had uh, stopped on the way to Lublin for some university lectures. After the morning mass, we walked along the tree-lined pathways for a long minute, exchanging just a few words that heightened the silence all around us. I said, the men who live here contemplate the silence of the beautiful presence in everything that, that exists. They cannot but perceive, perceive the meaning of life, I said. After a moment, after a moment, the cardinal completed my thought, because this meaning is here. Prophets, priests, and poets reveal to us that we belong to heaven, that is to our homeland and our refuge. Heaven says to us, you are mine, and we answer heaven, you are mine as well. 
the human person enraptured by heaven receives the identity from it. And with the, his identity, moral obligations. The experience of moral obligations show us, shows us to whom we belong. Sartre's words, l'enfer c'est les autres, hell is the other, are a lie. We ought rather to say, le ciel c'est les autres, heaven is other people. The man who remains bound to the earth is no longer naturus, to be born. For he cannot find in himself the strength for being reborn. One can be reborn only in another person. The man bent over his own immanence becomes an idiot. The Greek word idiotes means a man enclosed in his private interests. The idiot does not know natura because he does not know that he is naturus. And in consequence, he does not know the natural laws. The person is a work of art that man co-creates in dialogue with God. This co-creation is the very essence of the spiritual life, without which the human person does not become beautiful. The beauty of the divine mercy is, uh, is uh, uh, will, will save man. The key to the salvation of the person must always be sought in another person. For man is reborn and rises in the other person. The resurrection does not come into being through argumentation. It can come only being only in the into being only in a di dialogue of persons that transcends the cogito of each individual. The resurrection is fulfilled in the gift, the eternal eternal beauty is. Eternity reveals itself in the fragments of beauty that love, who is God, scatters throughout time. Listening to Chopin's music, Norvit wrote, through the pale wheat I see the host. Host, yeah, host. And Emmanuel already dwells on Mount Tabor. Through the pale wheat, I see already the host. Beauty strips the world of its dominion over the man who co-creates himself with the other, and definitely with God. People enraptured by the beautiful cannot be chained to the opinions and hypotheses that rule the world. People committed to the beautiful build a home and ethos for themselves on the foundation of freedom rather, rather than of tolerance. The world tolerates everyone except those who are free because it does not tolerate the beautiful. Bishop Karol Wojtyla and then Pope John II confronted this intolerance. The person is always love and not tolerance. Tolerance offends him. As in the midst of the cave, today too we are dominated by the slaves of opinion and experimental verification of these opinions. Everything the slaves do, they do at experimentum, and all they do should be, in their opinion, tolerated. They entrust themselves to no one and then nothing and trusting oneself forever to another person frightens them. The word eternity strikes fear into them, so they eliminate it from their memory together with its moral obligation, more obligations, and so everything is permitted. Detach it from reality, they reject the intellect that sees and reads man and the word intellectus, interledger, or erroneously into slavery. They become semi-illiterates who only know how to write the quantities they themselves have calculated, but they do not know how to read what they, what they have received, the letter. That they acknowledge and accept only that kind of calculation that is ratio, re, cal, re, 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 
calculate. They do not know how to read the writing they receive, which transcend their calculations. Poetry is foreign to them. People detached from reality do not leave the fundamental question regarding the origin and the end. This question cannot be calculated. It is already written in us. Man becomes the question. People detached from reality are humiliated by systems based on the presumption that persons can obtain their personal dignity by behaving as if they were gods. It means by the efficacy of their own calculating writings. They do not seek the origin and the end in the spirit that, that uh, breathes life into the dust of earth, of the earth. Rather, they seek the origin and end by breathing the dust of the earth into themselves. Detached from reality, people live without prophetic vision. Vision is love space, road Vaitiva. I would add that it is also the space of faith and of hope that is the space of freedom. He who sees, loves, and knows not only that which he sees. He knows also that which he does not see, but which leaves traces on the reality he contemplates. These traces allow us not to remain, remain blocked in this world. They lead us over even, even uh, uh, ever uh, farther, awakening us a desire for him whose beauty has left a reflection on beings accessible to human eyes. The beautiful is difficult because the love that is revealed in it is difficult. We cannot take possession of it. We can only become it, which means I cannot lean on. <laughs> we cannot take possession of it or the beauty. We can only become it, I repeat, which means that we must convert both to beauty and to love. The beauty defends us. The dream of modernity consists in the fact that the beautiful, which modernity has deformed, no longer defends man. It fragments him. Fortunately, however, it is impossible to overcome true beauty. Man can publicly reject it, but he cannot conquer it in his heart. Love flowing toward man in a torrent of beauty brings him the gift of a dignity infinitely greater than his humanity because it is the trace of the divinity. The torrent of beauty promises us divinity. Bishop Vaitua and then John Paul II spoke of these two artists. In these exercises and in the letter to artists as well. As uh, John Paul II. When Carl Vaitua spoke of moral experience, he referred to the original experience of beauty. It is upon this experience that he based his adequate anthropology. This anthropology is formed in the human person's dialogue with the source of the torrent of beauty. And in this torrent, we hear the voice of the source who calls us to himself with the voice of the true and the good. Metaphysics arises in the dialogue with this voice. I think that precisely here, in the contemplation of the torrent of beauty that flows, uh, flows through the person who is present to other persons, Karol Vaitua also found the link between phenomenology and metaphysics, the heart of which beats in those events that are the transcendentals, as verum bonum et pulchrum. John Paul II lived poetically during the years of his pontificate. But only at the end of his life did he return to the great lady, his words, great lady, as he called poetry. He reproached himself for not having always remained faithful to her, to the poetry. In a Roman triptych, 
He immersed himself once again in the torrent of beauty to help us join him in contemplating his, contemplating his own patrine ministry in the church. This time the question soars, where are you? was asked in the Sistine Chapel before Michelangelo's last judgment. Wonder at the source that is love was united with the trembling that comes in the face of the end, which is also love. In this Michelangelo's work, he saw the love that asked him three times, do you love me? Everything that John Paul II said about the human person can be summarized in the question regarding love and work. The story of the unity is interwoven with the story of man, the story of humanity, and the story of the church. Love and work. This story must have been a difficult dream for blessed John Paul II. In the first years of his pontificate, he confided to someone, I said, only death will free me from this cross. But he was not alone. He was saved by the moral experience of the beautiful in people who were present to him. Together with them, he contemplated the human person and the starry heaven. Together with them, he listened to the voice of his and their moral conscience. In them, beauty proclaims the future to us. It proclaims a new world that shines through the love and work. Beauty proclaims to man his new births. There are, however, no births without suffering. The beautiful enraptures, but it also provokes suffering. John Paul II showed, and perhaps merely reminded us, that it is impossible to distinguish the Via Polcritudinis from the Via Crucis. The true and the good happen only in these beautiful but sorrowful paths. The Via Dolorosa Pulchritudinis, the sorrowful way of beauty, leads to the love that is the father of great poetry, that is the father of immense freedom. The beautiful is difficult, but this does not mean that we should flee from it. Christ was also often repeated by John Paul II, be not afraid, free us not only from the fear in the face of inhuman systems, but also from the fear with which people often approach their body, their thoughts, and their actions. We must become it. And this happens only on the Via Crucis. Because beauty is Pascal. Man should, man should be ashamed of himself when he looks at his own body and at the body of the other person as if they were objects to be, to be used and then throw into, onto the scrap heap. Betrayal of the beautiful eliminates the Pascal character of beauty, of what is beautiful. We do not know how to die because we do not hope that we ought or can re be reborn the other person. But beauty, this beauty called by Vaitua Mercy, does not betray man. We can betray, but this beauty does not betray us. This is why it is called mercy. Mercy cannot be defeated. It can be crucified. But the crucifixion does not mean the victory of those who nail it to the cross. Merciful beauty is victor on the cross. Beauty unwells its every man in such a way that he must still seek it in order to be beautiful himself. He must ask for it and ask questions about it. In the spiritual, spiritual exercises for artists, we mentioned it above, Bishop Wojtyla continually repeated that the artist's work of creating which takes place within the flowing torrent of beauty, is owed to the source. If an artist is truly an artist, he creates works of art, especially the work of art that he himself is, with wonder and sense of gratitude, crying uninterruptedly, where are your source? 
Where are you? Ingratitude degener degenerates into an idolatry of one's own feelings, impressions, and talent. A work of art speaks with vision and power. <coughs> Excuse me. A work of art speaks with vision and silence. Those who know how to suffer live from vision and silence. Science help us to mature toward vision and toward the world that is silence. The man who does not perceive science will never escape his own imminence. Deprived of their apophatic help, he will not be able to open the path that leads him through himself. He will never accept the Savior. Let me paraphrase the Nietzsche's words. The man does not need ethical geniuses. He needs only the Savior. Karol Wojtyla matured under the cross he took up as he followed Christ. Under this cross, he learned to suffer, to be formed by love and by good that was traced out in the origin, but only brought to completion in the end by the merciful beauty that, that was exhausted for, her, for our sake. Only mer mercy can bring human love to fulfillment. Mercy that can bring even metaphysics to fulfillment. To Adam Kielowski, the future brother Albert, who asked on what path he might receive the grace of purification, his confessor gives only one piece of advice. Let yourself be molded by love. The witness, martyrium, that man bears to God under the cross completes the commandments, martyria, that God has written in human, heart, human hearts a witness to his, as a witness to his love. The martyria of God judge the martyrion of man. The love that is God judges the love that man has become in response to it. Under Christ's cross, man looks at himself with a rational tranquility. His work, permeated with the worship of God, creates a, uh, creates a culture of acts and words oriented to, oriented to God, the Father, in his filial world. I repeat that I distinguish culture and production. Yesterday, I have distinguished. The Father pronounces this word in eternity, and it is, and it in I don't know, I, I, coin, I am coining this word. And it inhumans itself from Greek, an anthropopoeisen, in the man, an anthropopoeisen. It is the word of Saint Athanasius in a specific historical moment and geographical place. God has come as far as that. I said, wait a while. Stop it but a step from nothingness, so near our eyes. It seemed to simple hearts, to open hearts it seemed, that he was lost amid the ears of corn. Oh, learned man, Christ by in this poem, heading masters, a morsel of bread is more real than the universe. The priest Karol Wojtyla elevated the pastoral interaction with, interaction with young people to the sphere of a shared contemplation of the beauty of the human person and God. On these heights, forgotten by postmodernity, it was clear that the person is saved by the presence of the other person. I do not recall specific conversation with Bishop Baitiwa or with Pope John Paul II about postmodernity. In Krakow, only Sartre worried him because of the iron logic with which the French philosopher drew the consequences of the denial of God's existence. At the time, we were 
dealing with the atheistic trampling of the dignity of the human person by means of the secret police. This violation of the person already implied the negation of God. Our experience of the trampling of human dignity was enough for us to know what the denial of God was and could be. The same denial that was upheld by the game of just justification thought up by so-called intellectuals in the West. We had the advantage of being able to bear witness to what we had seen, whereas they saw only themselves, the so-called intellectual of West. Out of necessity, we focused on the love that was made flesh and dwelt among us. This is where we sought refuge. Our questions about him contained a remembering of the commandment that rang out in paradise. Do not speak to the serpent. The men of the West, of the men of the church, I met them did not understand us. They reproached us for not knowing how to dialogue with the serpent. Bishop Vaitewa saw many people paralyzed by fear along the way toward the true and the good. This is why he repeated Christ's words so firmly, do not be afraid. I was once summoned for an interrogation by the secret police. The bishop, saying goodbye to me at the door of his apartment, clasped my hand very tightly and spoke these few but powerful words. Don't be afraid. Dabit or tibi in illa hora. It will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. And that is what happened. I said by Tewa, weak is the people. Weak is a people that accepts defeat forgetting that he was sent to keep watch till the coming of his hour. End of station. A people is strong when it keeps watch and awaits the dawn of the truths of man. In the man. Only such a people will not betray itself. Because only such a people is not afraid to speak the word with which it was sent to others. The way of this people is the via pulchritudinis and crucis the way of beauty and the cross. The human person does not need evangelization. He desires it. We don't need God. We desire him. Desire allows us and in some measure obliges us to live pascally. The human person is himself only when he bids farewell to the road he is going. Farewell. That is to say, to everything in the world and in himself that passes away and unites himself to that which remains. Only then I am myself. What remains is the meaning of what passes away. In its essence, evangelization is also the same because neither God, the Lord of time, nor the desire of man's restless heart are subject to change. Only the circumstances change in which the human person asks about God and seeks him. The circumstances that together form postmodernity favor man's dialogue with the serpent. In this dialogue, one does not build home on the foundation of the truths present in poetry and goodness, but on changing opinions. Postmodernity violates the human being. It forces him to dwell in comfortable negations of the truths desired by the man's restless heart. The postmodern reason does not enter into a personal dialogue with other people or God. It does not seek the truths. So we must not identify the new evangelization which we hear about more and more today with thinking up new apostolic projects. Evangelization will always consist, on the one hand, in leading the person out of a dialogue with the serpent and hope in his promises, and on the other hand, with the ins insistent search for the path to God a search 
and uh, surge announced by the restless heart in every human being. Christ's words are forever relevant. Convert and believe in the gospel. Begin a new life, converting to human beings and to God present in them. The idea, just the idea, <laughs> the idea of the new evangelization arose in Bishop Karol Wojtyla in the course of his struggle for the visible presence of the cross in the life of Polish society. Pope John Paul II first spoke of new evangelization under the cross of Cistercian Abbey at Mogiwa, near Krakow, not far from Nova Huta, where people struggled against the communist police in defense of the cross. They were more, many were victims, killed men during the struggles. Let us, I, I said by two, uh, it was uh, 79, the first pilgrimage in Poland, 79. Let us go together, pilgrims, to the Lord's cross, which it begins a new era in human history. This is the time of grace, the time of salvation. Through the cross, man has been able to understand the meaning of his own destiny of his life on earth. The history of Nova, of Nova Huta is also written by means of the cross. When the cross is raised, there is raised the sign that that place has now been reached by the good, good news of man's salvation through love. When the cross is raised, there is the sign that the evangelization has begun. A new evangelization has begun. As it were a new proclamation, as if it were a new proclamation, even, even if in reality it is the same as evil. The cross stands high, I continue citing. The cross stands high over the revolving world, stat crux, non volvitur orbis. I continue the citation. The new cross proclaimed the birth of the new church. This birth is deeply engraved on my heart. And when I have left the Sea of St. Stanislaus, Krakow, for the Sea of St. Peter, I took it with me as a new relic, a priceless relic of our time. End of station. Under this cross, people were transformed. Transformed. The world was transformed. Because under this cross, their love matured to the resurrection. The mystery of love, love, of work, and of resurrection is bound to the mystery of, cro of the cross. From, I say, from the cross of Nova Huta began the new evangelization, the, ev the evangelization of the second millennium. And the gospel is not proclaimed by functionaries who organize symposia at conferences, like this. <laughs> it, is <laughs> it is proclaimed by people who stand under the cross, convert to God, and so burn witness to truth and love crucified. They bear witness to the event indicated by the empty tongue. Words that have no effect in men negate evangelization. I say Norvit, wonderful words here, listen to it, to them. Those who were attentive made an effort for a day. The strong for a century, but the learned, as usual, formed a committee. The new evangelization of Europe and of the world needs the theology and the anthropology of martyr witnesses. Without the sensia crucis of people who stand under the cross, society becomes a mass of individuals who may at times function intelligently, but who always act stupidly because they lack the meaning to which the empty tom points. They debase themselves in their hiding places. Hiding, that is, fleeing from the cross, they become secularized. 
John Paul II carried his cross to the last uh, breath of his life. At the beginning of his pontificate, he said to one of his friends, only death will free me from the cross I carry. The human person will not have the courage to come forth from his hiding place, place if he does not allow himself to, to be enraptured by the beauty of truth and love nailed to the cross. For people not enraptured by this beauty, the cross is a wall and standing beneath it is meaningless. I say by two, suffering seems to belong to men's transcendence. It is one of those points in which man is in a certain sense destined to go beyond himself and he is called to this in a mysterious way. And we think logically, it seems to me, only under the cross. Logically. Only there can we think adequately to the transcendence of God and the transcendence of our own person. From there, we think coherently with the future, which is greater than anything that can be conceived. This is why crucified love cannot be eliminated from human affairs. The spirit of crucified love renews man and the earth. The spirit of crucified love evangelizes. People that hide themselves in the committee, co committees do not strike roots in the future that does uh, not pass away. They only, excuse me, they only twaddle, but they do not think, they do not speak, they twaddle, because they do not live. And they do not live because they do not die and rise. Thank you very much. We have now a few, few minutes for, uh, for questions. Maybe. You raise your hand and I close it. Thank you, Professor. Um, you spoke very eloquently about beauty in your talk and tied to the cross. I was wondering, you also mentioned John Paul II's Theology of the Body. And uh, I know he, he cared very much, very deeply about the beauty of sexual difference. And uh, beauty is acceptance of other, acceptance of difference. I was wondering if you could say something more about that. Um, his thought on beauty is acceptance of difference, uh, particularly sexual difference. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this question. Do you hear me? Yeah. 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 Oh, maybe, okay. Uh, tomorrow, we will meditate more profoundly about this question. But today, I will say only one thing, you know. The beauty of the sexual difference is in uh, Voitua's vision of human person, the path to God. Because the otherness of uh, the woman's otherness opens this path to man, and the man's otherness opens this path to God for a woman. You know, in this way, we can speak about the Pascal character of the sexual difference. It is in the sexual dif difference that I, that I must and I ought to die for myself in hoping that I will rise in another person, the husband in the wife and the wife in husband, you know. And this otherness of woman is for me the sign, trace, trace of God's otherness and vice versa. The otherness of man for the woman, you know. 
But it is not so easy to realize this difference and the beauty of this difference. Even this difference, because we live now in the world cons constructed by the predicates. We can predicate all about all. Therefore, the man can be woman and woman can be man. It is a predicativism, you know. We are detached from the reality. The reality. And I will repeat only one beautiful thought of Pascal. It is number 17 or 18 uh, in thoughts. The vulgar minds do not see, do, do not recognize, do not realize, and do not recognize the differences. How much vulgar we ought to be now in postmodernity that we do not recognize the differences, the fundamental differences in our life. But tomorrow the more, because tomorrow we will speak about the family, nation, and state. You know, so excuse me. But it seems to me that something I have answered, uh, said to you. Hmm? Two questions over there. At this. Thank you, Professor. Um, I know that Jiang Po II wanted to, go to evangelize China, but he never had the opportunity to go there in his lifetime. Do you, I'm wondering, do you know anything about his relationship with China? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I do not know the actual situation, political situa situation, and uh, the relation between the uh, Holy See, the Holy See, and uh, national, uh, national China. China, China, not China, China. I do not know the situation. Therefore, I cannot tell you uh, what kind of relations they, are, they were and they are. But I can say to you only one thing. They were and they are. <laughs> But, you know, all the rest is silence. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, my question is about, you said that, um, you know, you were talking about, I think it was part of the poetry of John Paul II, how he said that, um, you know, it may have been in one of his poems where it was, I am not beauty, but beauty flows through me, when you're talking about the artist and whatnot. Um, now, my question is how we hold that and um, the universality and I guess the, um, uh, the transcendence of beauty with the fact that um, the particularity of it is, the, is that, or the reality of it is that this particular form strikes me. Um, so there, insofar as everything else, everything points to its source, which is beauty and reflects some sort of beauty, we still, there is still something about say this particular um, form, this particular individual, even you know, within marriage, why would you marry this person? Um, and it just, it's, I guess it's a perennial question in a sense, but how we kind of hold those two together, the universal and the particular, um, and how that kind of reflects the thought of John Paul II. I do not know whether I have understood well you, what you have uh, asked me. It seems to me that your question is this. How we can see, realize the universal in the in the, in the particular? The trace is not, I, I do not know. It is this question? No. Yeah. In the love, in the beauty, this this fragment. So <coughs> linked to the poem you, you read or the poet that uh, John Paul II said that the beauty passes through me, not me. Ah. So how's the relationship between the, the transcendent? Yeah. If you are interested in these words of 
Zygmunt Krasinski, our poet, no? that the torrent of beauty flows through you, artists, but you are not beauty. Karol Wojtyła did not cite the second part of this phrase, where the poet, where the, someone says to this poet, yes, you are not the beauty. Your children, your wife, are more beautiful than you because they are sharing this beauty that flows through the torrent. And you only, and through you, it only passes. But you do not share it. It is special poet in this Polish dram, Nieboska Komedia, uh, not divine comedy. Wonderful piece, wonderful uh, work. So, you know, the fragment we are of the beauty, we are obliged, called and obliged, to become more and more beautiful, hoping that maybe there will come the time in which the beauty itself will come to us, transform us, transfigures us, transfigures us, and renders us, I dare say, the beauty itself, God. It is this. But it is only in this work the man is. And the man is this uh, work of art, you know. And only in, in him it happens. And in this way, I think, when the poet or yes, describes this event of flowing through the poet, the beauty, he is describing it in the phenomenological way, you know, but living it and becoming the true, good, and beautiful more and more, he becomes an event we call metaphysics. You know. That is this, it seems to me. Uh, the relation between the torrent of beauty and the beautiful man who become, becomes more beautiful, you know, who desires to become more beautiful. And therefore, it seems to me that we ought to follow the voice of our in quiet heart, St. Augustine, in quiet heart, this voice for us is trace, trace that calls us. And only he, listening to this voice, following the trace, it is. We can see and realize the beautiful, the true, the good in every being, not only human beings, in every being. Only when beautiful, true, and good is happening in me, in the relation with the other, I can contemplate the beautiful of river, beautiful of flowers, beautiful of clouds, and so on, and so on, you know. So through anthropology, I can enter in the world and do, if I can say so, the cosmology, or rather metaphys metaphysics, you know.
and Wojtyła, I think that he has found the place of this unity between phenomenology and metaphysics in his own person, in his moral experience, being called fascinated and raptured by the beauty and being called by the voice to go ever farther, to transcend himself, you know, in this, to good, to beautiful, and to uh, true, to true. I don't know whether it was really your question, <laughs> but <laughs> no. hey. last question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is about um, the phrase that John Paul II started saying a lot at the beginning of his pontificate: "Be not afraid." And I've heard different answers, different reasons why he said that. And I was wondering with your personal friendship, your relationship with him, if he ever, if he ever said anything to you, why did he start saying that? Was it, um, or maybe if there's something in his writings you know about that, that gives a hint to that, but why was that so significant to him, be not afraid? It was our experience in the time of Nazi's occupation, I have said it and of the Soviet, uh, no, Soviet Dominion, the same thing. Uh, that he realized it and he lived it. He encountered many persons that were paralyzed by the fear. They were scared. They are, because the fear, you know, was the principle of, I do not say, I cannot tell uh, of governing, but of administering uh, the society, the fear. It was a principle. Therefore, he tried to affront this principle with something that could conquer, win inside the man, this paralyze, you know. And he found it in the Christ's words, be not afraid. The apostle was very scared. Be not afraid, I am with you. You know, uh, it seems to me that many, many times he strengthened us. Like in this situation I have told you when I was summoned to the secret police and I suspected that it was a problem of Karol Wojtyla that they were, uh, that they ought to, ought to, that he will uh, to ask me. And we talk, particularly in the room where we were sure that they, are, they were the micro, because we wanted that the police knew <laughs> that we were already speaking about this encounter. No? And I remember very well what kind of force entered in me when he, embracing me, told me, Stanislav, don't be afraid. Dabitur tibi in illa hora. You know, this situation, this experience, led Karol Wojtyla to the Christ's words, don't be afraid. Concrete experience of paralyzing fear. It was genial uh, principle of administering the society, the fear. And then, being in the West countries during three years, uh, 46, 7, 8, he has seen that the people were fearing, but quite different powers, not like who in Poland, the Soviet uh, communists and so on and so on. The economical power, the some political powers, you know, 
And when he cried in 78 in the St. Peter's Square, don't be afraid. It was addressed, these words, these words were addressed not only to us in uh, East Europe, Eastern Europe, but also in, to the Western people who were fearing quite different powers. Do not fear the economics, the economical powers, because they do not create the history. The history, you are creating the history, not they. You know. So don't be afraid, don't be afraid. But implicitly, it said, if you do not fear, you will walk. You will, you must walk on the cross, uh, via crucis, via pulchritudinis. But don't be afraid. You can be even killed, but don't be afraid. You will arise. If you fear, you are no more free. The free men do not fear. Because all the police could do to me was to kill me, nothing more. But I hoped that I will rise. <coughs> then that is the meaning, that was the meaning of the words, don't be afraid. Thank you very much.